there is no try. What? You, you, don't, you don't think he said that? What? No, <laughs> seriously, I'm totally sure he said this. Anyone? No? No, look it up. Like, seriously, he totally said this, it's right. I'm like, John told me, and John knows his stuff. Like, why would he lie to me? Have you ever been in a situation where somebody is so incredibly right about what they are trying to say, and because of your own experience or your own knowledge, you know that they may just be a little bit off the mark. Now, before anyone jumps up and <laughs> tries to assault me, I know it wasn't Yogi, it was in fact Yoda. So, for whatever reason, or whatever kind of belief we have about something, sometimes it can create a conflict with other people. So, at the start of last year, our product teams got told that we were to start delivering experiences rather than features. And some people were really excited about this because it meant that we could start putting the customer first, we could start looking at UX even more, but some people were really, really frustrated and really scared about this uh, possibility because they'd been doing things, they'd been doing it the right way or however they felt was the right way for years, so why should they change? Why should they start focusing on uh, experiences? So one of the solutions that we had to solve this problem was to, let's just put a designer in our teams. And for all, I guess, good thinking that may have been for some people, fortunately for us, we found out that we didn't have enough designers to go around. So this is a little bit of a blessing in disguise because instead of trying to solve a cultural or a team problem with an individual, we managed to avoid it. So why is this important that we look at it from a team perspective or a cultural perspective? And how do we move from having a very fixed mindset about something to more of a growth mindset? Now, basically because of all the things. So this is a pie graph, as you can see, it's a pie. <laughs> and it's split into three pieces. So there's what I know I know, what I know I don't know, and then there's a huge piece of the pie, which is what I know, what I don't know I don't know. Now, I know that I know how to bake a pie because I baked this for this presentation. <laughs> I couldn't find a slide that was the pie cut into three, so I just baked it myself. <laughs> I thought, what I know I don't know, I don't know how to Photoshop this, so I'll bake it. <laughs> and then there's things that I don't know I don't know. And in the case of Yogi and Yoda, maybe I was so sure that I knew that, that I wasn't even aware I didn't know it. So this is really important, because once we accept that there is a whole possibility of things that we just do not know right now, because there is so much to know in the world, we can start to question the things that we think we do know and move more toward, towards this growth mindset. And of course, this all starts with people. So I truly believe that the people behind the product are more interesting and more complex than what they create. And this got me thinking about how can I look at development teams through the lens of UX? And this got me thinking about personas. Now we create personas to build empathy with our users. We create them to create a connection with somebody. But all too often in product teams, we sometimes turn to what I call the dark side of the persona, the stereotype. And we turn to these things in times of highly stressed um, environments. So you may have thought or may have heard somebody say, oh, testers, they just break things all the time. Product owners, they just care about the deadline. Oh, designers, they'll just want to change it again. Now we start to stereotype these people and we forget that they are individuals and that they have feelings and emotions and that we should be looking at them from an empathic viewpoint, just as we try to do with our user testing. So if we do this, what we're actually doing is we're driving a disconnection with the people that we work with. I don't know about you, but I don't have anyone in my organization called testing or called product owner. I have people that do those roles, 
but I don't have people that are named those things. And I think we do this sometimes to kind of make it so that we're not attacking a person, we're just kind of attacking their role. But as I said, this type of thinking drives disconnection with the people that we work with. So we need to stop stereotyping and stop looking at people for just the roles that they do and start looking at people as an individual with unique skills and unique knowledge and experience and start to treat them with a little bit more empathy. Now what I want you to do is I want you to think of a picture of a bird. Got it? Cool. So did anyone think of these birds? Yes, no one. Fantastic. Great. <laughs> You've proved my point. Uh, so I have a prototype in my head of a bird, and this is my prototype. Now you had a different prototype. And so when I said bird, you conjured up a mental prototype in your head that just did not match mine. Technically, we were both correct, because you thought of a bird, I thought of a bird, but we definitely are not on the same page. So how do we accept that when we say something like technical or A-B testing or UX, that unless we go a little bit deeper, we might be trying to communicate with somebody that has a completely different picture in their head of what that word means. Now, if I had have said, think of a budgie, you might have been a little bit closer. If I had have said, think of a, a blue or a yellow budgie, you would have been even closer still. But it's recognizing that words mean different things to different people. And if we can start looking at mental prototypes and making sure that the ideas and the words that we use work together and that we're testing each other's mental prototypes as we, as we communicate and as we explain things, then we're kind of limiting the, the amount of surprises that can happen at the end of the development process. Because people say they like surprises, but sometimes they don't. And I call this the what's in the box effect. So it's not a reference to the movie Seven, because that's just, just horrible. Um, <laughs> but this happened when we started measuring success. So when we wanted to ship experience, we thought, oh, we know, we need some metrics. We need to measure how successful we are. But unfortunately, what we did is that we measured success. And then when we started measuring and found out that we weren't as successful as we were hoping to be, we would open the box and say, ta-da, we, we only hit 3% of our conversion rates. Oh, no, close the box. I don't want to hear that. You're measuring success. You're not measuring failure. So, <laughs> so it was kind of like the surprise of opening the box and not knowing what's inside was really uh, conflicting for some people. And the immediately, immediately what they wanted to do was just close the box again and just, let's just try again with the next one. And next time, just make sure you measure success, okay? Uh, <laughs> it's a bit facetious, but it wasn't quite that bad. Um, so how do we get around this? Well, we got around this by making sure that we keep the box open at all times. So we're really transparent when we build something and when we're setting up our success, success measures and our success criteria. So we look at things like, hey, this could be successful, but it could also fail. And if it does fail, what can we do to remedy that? So what can we do to make sure that the feature that we put out into our production environment is healthy? And if we see that it's getting a little bit sick, because the box is open, because we're being transparent, we can then iterate and make changes and kind of give that feature the, the love and care it needs to be able to get healthy again. Because what underpins all this is empathy. Now, Brene Brown says it best when she says, really, does an empathic response begin with at least? Now, there is a big difference between empathy and sympathy. Empathy builds connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. And I started to listen to the conversations that we were having with people around what we were discussing when it was time for a feature to almost go live. So sitting in those rooms before we go live, we kind of go, all right, what have we done? What's not working? What's working? And three phrases 
uh, really stood out for me. And they were, at least, so, oh, at least they can do this. We know it's not working perfectly, but, hmm. Uh, oh, don't worry, there's a workaround for that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they'll really enjoy that workaround that takes 12 steps and then, uh. And don't worry about it, it's an edge case. I think edge case is my favorite and it's something that I just want to completely obliterate. <laughs> and the reason for that is that we built a system that allowed somebody to get into the state that they got into. So for me, that's not an edge case. That's just something you've allowed to happen. And people will do whatever you allow them to. And I've seen this time and time again where we go, oh, don't worry, no one will ever do that. And we put it into live, and within the first couple of hours, we've got a ticket from our customer experience team saying, oh, we've had a customer, and they've done, ah, crap. <laughs> John said we'd never do that. <laughs> but they do, and it's because we allowed them to, and it's because we let them. So in these meetings, we have a, a kind of a, a rule where if somebody says at least, work around, or edge case, that's a bit of a red flag. So that's a red flag for us to kind of say, did we really do the best job that we could have done on this? Is there more we need to do? Why are we building something that we're allowing to cause pain for our customers with? And if we are, and if it is one of those things that we just have to deal with, then let's at least provide some safety net for them. Let's give them as much help as possible. So even if we can't fix it, let's give our customer experience team the, the information that they need so that when that person does call up, and they eventually will, they can give them the right piece of advice at the right time. So sometimes it's not a software fix, but it's more of a holistic fix. So today, I wanna leave you with a question because change is really hard. And that question is, how much change do you have? Because change doesn't start with other people. Change starts with yourself. And if you can look at things a little bit differently, if you can accept that there's a big piece of the pie, that there are things that you just don't know, and you're okay with not knowing because you can learn, or you can discover, or somebody else will help you out with that, then we can all work together as a more collaborative team so that we can utilize each other's skills, each other's experiences, each other's passions, and build a much better experience for everyone. So we talk a lot about the user experience or the customer experience, but what about the people experience? What about the team experience? What about the people building the thing that eventually goes out to our customers and our users? So as you go to lunch, I want you to think about how much change do you have? Thank you.